Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a follow-up companion video to the Avengers Endgame open spoiler discussion that we, of course, did on Sunday. Now, of course, we did a five-hour Avengers Endgame open spoiler discussion, and we just scratched the surface. Even after five hours of getting around to all the questions you guys sent in, I want to make sure all the questions you guys sent in get addressed, and that's why they're going to be multiple parts. They're going to be multiple parts. This is part two. Uh, there's probably going to be part three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Me and Robert are going to go back and forth uh, doing these companion videos to the Avengers Endgame open spoiler discussion. And just to confirm again, this is the continuation of the Avengers Endgame open spoiler spoiler discussion so if you guys have not yet seen avengers endgame and you don't want to get spoiled do not watch this video just add this to your view later list and come back and watch it another time uh, but for now you might want to avoid it so with that down and out of the way let's start getting caught up on all the things you guys wanted to talk about when it comes to Avengers Endgame. We're going to start things off here today with Angry Irish Benjamin who wrote, uh, also, how about that timeline, huh? So will Marvel movies just be four years into the future or five years into the future uh, from now on? Wonder how they're going to resolve that. I, I can only assume. Like, remember, Kevin Feige said, like, the MCU is going to be a different place after Endgame, right? He said that before Endgame came out. And now we're five years later. And I assume, remember when the first Spider-Man Far From Home trailer came out? It showed his passport, but the years were marked out. You couldn't see the years. They CGI'd out the years. It's like, wait a minute, because like apparently the year is going to be 2023. Or I guess it is four years in future now because the extra year since Infinity War. Okay, fine, I'll give you that. Um, but my assumption right now is that other than prequel stuff, Everything's going to be five years or four years later in the future. Now, I suspect the Black Widow movie will happen in that five-year gap between the end of Infinity War and the beginning of Endgame. I don't know that for sure. It could be much before that. I think that's going to happen there. But I think the quote-unquote current timeline is now 2023. I think. I don't know. We're going to have to see how that all, re all that resolves. All right. Angry Irish Benjamin follows up and says, Avengers assemble. He finally said it. Indeed, he did, which got everybody geeked out. Now, granted, I was kind of hoping to hear a big, loud leadership proclamation. Avengers assemble. Instead, he gave the big, loud Avengers and then assemble. And then, you know, Robert was joking, saying everybody, all the Avengers in the back were probably going, what? But anyway, he still said it. That's the important thing. And we all geeked out unanimously. Uh, Angry Irish follows up with sidebar. I heard somewhere that Lady Sif was due to get her own Disney Plus series a while back, but haven't heard anything since. Your thoughts on the matter? I like the Lady Sif uh, character. I really like Jamie Alexander. I'd be totally down for a Lady Sif uh, series. I don't think we're going to get it. I mean, a Lady Sif and the Warriors 3, that's a cool show you could have done, but the Warriors 3 are all dead. Uh, they died in Thor in the first couple of seconds of Thor Ragnarok, so she, so that's not there. So all you're left with is Lady Sif. I haven't honestly heard anything about it. I'd be down for it, but I don't think that's happening because I haven't heard anything, but sign me up if they do want to do it. Uh, Angry Irish Benjamin also writes, I mean, I could have forgiven some of it. It felt more earned, but no Thor. Just say, fuck it. I don't want to be king. Just want to faff around the galaxy and fight people. You be in charge. That's it. I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there, Angry Irish. Uh, I mean, I could have forgiven some of it. It felt more earned, but no Thor. That probably has some is connected to an earlier thing you sent in that we did answer in the main show that we're not getting around to now. So my apologies, but anyway, about that. Okay, so uh uh Abra Abra Zas616 writes, that scene, uh cheeseburger between Hap and Morgan, it's so genuine and sweet at the same time, it makes you realize even more that they are family. Oh God, man, I love that. I really did. I, I just adored that. I thought that was great. When I think the best acting moment in all of Endgame, and it's a little bit more subtle, but is the job John Favreau does when he says, you hungry? She says, yeah, what do you want? And she says, cheeseburgers, which was, of course, Tony's favorite thing. And when she says cheeseburgers, watch the next time you see the movie, just watch John Favreau's face and, and how he does that scene it's so beautiful 
And then he turns her and says, you know, your dad loved cheeseburgers. Oh, I, I, honestly, with all the great moments, that might have been my favorite. Other than, you know, Cap getting Mjolnir and stuff like that. But uh, as far as emotional moments in the movie goes, that might have taken the cake for me. Uh, Darth Suthius writes, as soon as I heard on your left, out loud, I blurted, oh shit, it's Falcon. Woman next to me giggled. Then again, I said, oh shit, a lot throughout. Yeah, that was a great moment. Like when you first heard the buzz, when you first heard the earpiece, or oh, Cap, I, I didn't realize that was Sam until the second line came out. Cap, on your left, it's like, oh my God, it's Sam. Because we should have remembered that they already established that the snap worked. But you're right, man. That was a great moment. It's really cool that they had Sam being the first point of contact. I thought that was pretty cool. All right. Bruce Gordon writes, um, wife died five years ago, remarried. Now she's back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody else brought that up, Bruce, about, man, uh, imagine all those awkward conversations that have to happen now. <laughs> like people who lost girlfriends, husbands, wives, whatever. And then five years is a long time. In five years, they've gotten, they've, they've moved on and they've gotten together with somebody else. And now they're back. Endgame doesn't deal with that. Then <laughs> that is a, that is a pretty funny, that would be a great, funny short. Like if Marvel produced like a short 10 minute YouTube video on, you know, couples after the snap and like, what do you mean you remarried? I've been gone for five minutes. Actually, you've been gone for five years. That's going to be a global problem. It'd be kind of funny to see them uh, deal with that. Uh, Angry Irish Benjamin. Oh, and this is what you're referring to earlier, Irish. Uh, Thor send off as both a character and a franchise got my goat. Uh, I get that they didn't want to just go back to how things were, but it felt so unsatisfactory. Uh, no sign of Lady Sith, Thor's a <laughs> lard ass, et cetera. Well, I mean... What's the best way to put that? I mean, I the running, look, I don't mind. What, what I actually enjoyed was Thor emotionally destroyed and his physical condition was just a reflection of where he was emotionally. And, and yeah, he let himself go for five years and whatever. The only thing I didn't like was I didn't like the on-running Big Lebowski joke. That I got tired of. It was really funny at first, but I got tired of it. But the, the condition he was in and all that kind of stuff, I get it. And they built up to that send off with his conversation with his mother. You know, it's like we all fail at what we're supposed to be. The true measure of a hero is how good we become who we are, you know, and I thought they kind of set that up. And I think after like that five year journey he had been on and everything that he'd had, Getting away from what was left of Asgard was not a bad thing. So I got to tell you what, that actually worked for me. The running Lebowski joke didn't, but everything else actually did work for me, Angry Irish. But I can see why it didn't work for you. I, I get it. Um, Abraxas616 writes, uh, want capped when Cap tightened his shield and faces Thanos' army alone in a I plant myself like a tree, you move. Oh, yeah, that was good. But ultimately never have to. And then Falcon calling on your left, goosebumps, cries of joy, need new pants. Dude, I'm telling you what, I need a full-size poster uh, width-wise of that wide shot of Cap standing alone on that hill facing down Thanos's, the Thanos, the Black Order, and his entire army by himself. That in a moment is Captain America right there. I love, I need that poster, man. I need that poster. And then of course, just as he's getting ready to run in there and face them all himself, he gets the call on your left and it was great. It was magnificent. We all ate it up, man. All right, Big, uh, big Four Dam and Alfie Gamer writes, Hey guys, love the movie. Hawkeye losing his family to the snap started the feels. Cap wielding Mjolnir started the orgasm and Iron Man snap death killed me off uh, to a blubbering mess. Loved it 3000. Yeah, I mean, I I actually said, I remember the first time we saw that one trailer with Hawkeye with his family. I said, oh, that's your opening scene of the movie. That's going to be your opening scene of the movie. Now, the only thing that was different was I thought he was going to see them starting to dust and was holding her, the daughter, as she completely dusted away. Now, they didn't do that, but I like the way they did it. And that was really beautifully set up. And of course, the cap getting Mjolnir. Oh, my God. Like, I didn't think they would do that in this movie because, you know, Mjolnir's gone and everything like that. So I didn't think they would do it. 
amazing fan service there. And again, people think fan service is a dirty word. It's not when it's used right. The fan service of that, having him have Mjolnir, and then as Odin enchanted it, possessing the power of Thor, using the lightning and all that kind of stuff. Oh my God. I was losing my mind. I was absolutely losing my mind. All right. Rude Shot writes, uh, was there two caps in their timeline all along then? Well, what the, the Russo brothers have come out recently said, um, actually, Cap went back, and this is, creates new problems. Cap went back, then in 2016 of his new time, he transported back to the current time, which of course is inconsistent with the whole thing about when they come back from something, they have to come back to the time machine that they build, right? That's the way it always was. So they're... It's inconsistent if it's one way. It's inconsistent if they do it the other. And I see, here's the thing. As a fan of, of Star Wars, as a fan of DC Comics, as a fan of the Marvel films, as a fan of w whatever movies, I'm cool saying, hey, yeah, there's a loophole there. Or not a loophole, a plot hole there and a plot hole there. But you know what? If it's not too severe, you know what? Didn't affect my enjoyment of the film. There are some people, it just seems like if you admit there's a plot hole, it invalidates your joy of the film, which is ridiculous. Like I remember in my social media posts I put out, I've, Avengers Endgame, I've never enjoyed a movie with so many plot holes so much. And it's true. Look, I acknowledge the plot holes in it, but the result of some of those plot holes were amazing experiences and I'll, I'll take them. It's just really weird to me that people feel like they've got to scramble and come up with these outrageous things to pretend like there's no inconsistencies and no contradictions and no plot. There are. They're there. Maybe not everything I think is a plot hole is a plot hole, but there are plot holes and inconsistencies there. And it just seems weird to me as a film fan that other fans of the movie just refuse to acknowledge it. It's like, you know, you're allowed to acknowledge it. There's some inconsistencies and contradictions and still love the movie, right? I don't know, that's just me, but it, it, according again, which seems to me like damage control, what the Russo brothers were just talking about is that, uh, no, he teleported again, which if you can just teleport to any time, anywhere, any, any time with the, your little time GPS, then why did they need to build their time machine in the first place? You know, anyway, if it's either consist inconsistency A or inconsistency B, you take your pick. Uh, Angry Irish Benjamin writes, Cap saying Hail Hydra, hilarious, so unexpected, but so perfect, right? So perfect. And you know what? I thought that was a good moment. But every time I saw the movie, and I've seen it four times now, the audience thought it was like the most hilarious thing. And they also just started laughing their fool heads off. It was really, really cool to hear. Um, okay. We move on now to Mad1306 who writes, So Avengers time travel method is the same as Dragon Ball Z. You only affect the timeline future you go back to, not your own original timeline. That's what they say. And yet the original timeline is affected. I, I Again, I said, to, uh, I said to Rob, I bring this up again. If you are saying that any time travel doesn't affect your present time, then... How do you explain old man Steve Rogers in the present? By whichever path and whichever theory you want to use, our present timeline now has an old man Steve Rogers that wasn't there before. And he's there now. Current timeline changed as a result of time travel. And the, the question I posed to Rob this one time was, okay, if Steve Rogers at the end of Endgame doesn't get on that time machine and travel back to take to take the stones back, does old man Steve Rogers end up in our present? The answer to that is no. And if the answer to that is no, then you cannot say our present is not affected by time travel. It clearly was. And there's other examples of that throughout it too. So I don't know, like I, I'm not a big Dragon Ball Z fan, so I don't know how that works in Dragon Ball Z, but that was at least the basic construct that Bruce was trying to set up near the beginning of the film. And that great scene when he's expressing time travel and um, Ant-Man goes, so Back to the Future was bullshit? I mean, that scene was great. And that in that scene where Bruce sets up their rules of time travel, he kind of lays it out there. 
Okay, Hector Jeter writes, love that shot with Cap facing Thanos' army. God, man, I, I tell you that, I want that mounted on a poster. I want that painted on a mural on the side of my house. I want that tattooed on my butt. I will. I love that shot. That's going to be one of the best, most iconic shots ever. I just loved it so much. Uh, Angry Irish writes, still remember Tony's first solo movie and how much I loved it at the time. Needless to say, his death was so poignant. And that, it, I mean, there was something very poetically appropriate about him being the one to die at the end, considering it really was Iron Man that started off the franchise, right? And for it to come down to him dying at the end, I thought was really poetically appropriate. And it was beautiful and was nice. And you're right, it harkens us back to the way that first Iron Man movie came out of nowhere and took the world by storm. Uh, Nate Piazzantino writes, liked it a lot, just not as much as I hoped I would. I mean, hey man, that, that happens with a lot of movies. I'm sure a lot of people went into Endgame hoping for the greatest movie of all time. And of course, that's unrealistic for any movie you go into. Um, and you know, you know what, Nate? Some people just didn't like the movie. All film is subjective. And if it didn't work for you as well as you had hoped, cool. You know, not everybody likes The Godfather. Not everybody likes Star Wars. Not everybody likes Blade Runner, me. Um, not everybody likes some of these films that everybody else. And sometimes we go into movies and like them, but it doesn't quite live up to our expectations. Nothing wrong with that. You went in, you watched it, it hit you and gave you the experience that it did, and at least you still enjoyed it, right? Um, uh Abrax, I never know how to pronounce this. Abrax's um, 616 writes, also, thanks for opening the super chat early. I'll be watching Endgame again during the show. Ha <laughs> ha. Love the show. Spoil the Endgame. Shut up and take my money. Well, you know what's funny? I, because this was a big deal. Us doing our, our Avengers Endgame spoiler review was a big deal. And so I wanted to put up the live event early. And so I put up about a day early, a little less than a day early about 20 hours early, I think. So it was there and people would know there it is. And I knew some people would start firing in questions early. I couldn't believe, I think we had uh, over 500 questions when it was still 12 hours to go before. I wasn't anticipating that. But it speaks to the experience that Endgame gave that everybody wanted to talk about that much. It's crazy. Uh, Sebastian Trulio writes, love it, but many... Uh, but many to nitpick. Iron Gauntlet, Rat, mm, Tony able to handle five stones, yeah. Uh, nano quantum suits, time travel discovery in days. In general, Tony's magic, still willing to pass it all for a great experience. Yeah, you're not wrong on any of them. And look, for each one of them, like, yeah, I don't like the Iron Gauntlet. That was dumb. I mean, there's only one person in the universe who should be able to put together something that can harness the power of the Infinity Stones. And that is a magical giant dwarf living in the center of the universe, forging it in the heart of a dying star. Oh, but Tony, who's on a tens of thousands of years more primitive and technologically devanced world like ours, oh yeah, I can make one. Give, give me a couple of days, I'll make one. I mean, that's stupid. That's as magic as his iron armor is now. It's just, it was, it's, that's kind of nonsensical, but I'm completely with you. I'm willing to overlook it because it created this great experience of me viewing, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it was a silly thing. The rat, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Is it awfully convenient? Yes. But even in sports, even the best team every once in a while needs a lucky break. I have no problem with our heroes or the narrative being furthered at some point by a lucky break because that's real life. And notice that the rat didn't hit the button in day one or in week one or after one month or not even after one year. It was five full years, you know, 52 weeks in each of those years, seven days in each of those weeks, 24 hours in each of those days, you know, 60 seconds in each of those hours. And then finally, they caught a break and a rat tripped over a thing, setting off the events of Ant-Man coming out, coming up with the idea and all the events go into motion. Was it a lucky break? Yes, but I'm okay once in a while, just like in real life, that it's a lucky break that propels our narrative forward. And, and I'm kind of okay with that. Nano quantum suits, yep, uh, I get it. Figuring out time travel in just like a day and a half, yep, I get it. Uh, Tony being able to even wear the um the five stones when the hulk 
was on the edge of agony, screaming. Oh, but Iron Man wears them? Cool. Yeah, oh, ooh, this is tough. I am Iron Man. But I'm in complete agreement with you, Sebastian. I, because of the experience that those conveniences inconsistencies because of the experiences that we got as a result of those things i'm willing to overlook it because it delivered a fantastic experience that i just enjoyed and loved so i'm completely with you on that sebastian i'm completely on board with you there all right let's see here um <laughs> ab 616 writes again i think i cried five times on my first viewing tony calling cap a liar cap saying avengers assemble tony's final rest funeral and cap's new life oh and also the six sign credits cry time yeah robert i remember watching that i'm like where have i seen this before and robert pointed out it was that last star trek movie with the original cast that they did that exact same thing with the autographs of them i thought that was great i thought that was wonderful i, I really really did get a big kick out of that um I thought, you know, some people complain about Cap's little or Iron Man, Tony's meltdown on Captain America. It's like, um, dude, Cap gave you the phone to say, whenever you need me, you call me and I'll be there. And you never called. And as soon as Bruce called Cap, Cap came. Cap came. He saved Vision and Wanda, hooked up with Bruce and, and uh, Rhodey. And they mounted the defense on Earth. So it made so people were going, why was that was kind of stupid for him to do that? But it wasn't all that stupid. Remember, Tony just got the beating of his life, stranded in space for almost a month, thought for sure he was going to die, you know, lost the kid, lost half of humanity, all that kind of stuff. He's broken physically and mentally. Of course he's gonna lash out. Of course, Tony's going to lash out. And you could tell that Steve understood that. I mean, Steve gave him that one little shoot back, like when Tony says, I wanted to build, because his, his jaw was all swollen up. I wanted to build a suit of armor around the world. And Tony's like, how'd that work out? Or Steve said, and how'd that work out? But after that, he didn't say another thing. Because I think even Steve understood Tony's broken physically. He's broken mentally. He's broken emotionally. And of course, he and he's angry and he's lashing out. And I think we as fans should understand that. And I think because Steve understood it. So anyway, yeah, there's that. But that was a very emotional moment. Absolutely. Uh, Hector Jeter writes, loved when Black Panther called out Hawkeye by his name. Clint calling back from Civil War when he didn't care when Clint. That was that was a really good. And I'm glad I'm not the only one who noticed that because at, at the time I thought, I bet no one else knows that. But apparently everybody else did. Of course, in Civil War, he's like, hi, I'm Clint. I don't care. And now it's like, Clint, buddy, give it to me. And that was a really nice callback and a great way to kind of introduce this really fan service sequence of events of past the hot potato with the gauntlet, getting all of our favorites, getting a turn, like carrying it around. It was just great. It was such a thrill ride. It was so cool to see, and I love that he did that. Uh, Benny95 writes, I enjoyed the comedy in Thor Ragnarok, but I feel they've taken it too far in Endgame, making Thor feel like the clown of thunder instead Pardon me. Instead of a god. I was also disappointed to see Hulk not go beast mode. Look, I, I'm, I've been very open. If, if I have any big disappointments in Endgame, it's the fact that, again, Hulk, true Hulk, was left on the bench. For the second film in a row, Hulk was left sitting on the bench. And I don't know if some bully picked on the Russo brothers when they were young, whose favorite comic book was the Hulk, and that made them hate the Hulk. <laughs> but I mean, at the same time, they did some great things with Bruce in the movie, right? Remember, ultimately, everybody will talk about Tony saving the day. But before that, it was Bruce who snapped everybody back. It was Bruce that snapped his fingers and brought everybody back. Yes, Tony then defeated Thanos' army with a snap, absolutely. But we all seem to be forgetting that Bruce, Hulk, is the one who saved everybody. He wore the glove, he snapped everybody back into existence, which by the way, if he doesn't do that, then the Wakandan army, Black Panther, Spider-Man, the Guardians, none of them would come back to join in the fight against Thanos at the end, and Thanos ultimately wins. 
He also gave him a lot of great uh, narrative purpose. Like he's the one who went and had his conversations with the Ancient One. They did a lot of good stuff with Bruce. So let's not take anything away from that. Hulk slash Bruce did some really cool things in this movie. But I'm not going to lie to you, Benny. I was also a little bit disappointed that we didn't get to see Hulk as Hulk. They've given us Hulk as Hulk once. And that was in the first Avengers movie. They've never really let us see him get completely unleashed since. And I was really hoping they would do that here. And I agree with you. Look, the Big Lebowski Thor joke was really funny at first to me. And then they just made it into a running gag that I lost interest in. So I, I'm with you on that. I am. I'm with you on that, Benny. Uh, Mad1306 writes, Well, John, you got your wish. Bucky didn't become Cap. Now Sam is. I can't wait for the Disney Plus series. Wonder if Sam will don the outfit like he did in the comics. Here's an interesting thing, Mad. In a Wired interview, um, he said... Falcon is not Captain America. Interesting, right? Because he's sitting there taking all these questions about Falcon and his role in the movie and all that kind of stuff. And this question comes in about, you know, um, when does Falcon become Cap? And he says, Falcon isn't Captain America. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything 100% definitive, but I found that really interesting that he, as Falcon, would say that. So... And by the way, it wasn't my wish that Bucky doesn't become Captain America. It's just that in the MCU, that's very problematic. A guy who's mentally still kind of damaged. He's already, who knows how much has been done in his brainwashing. He's done too much. You just can't make him. In that reality, you can't make him Captain America. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see if they say, I'm noticed that they're still calling the show Falcon and Winter. they're not calling him Captain America. I don't know that he's going to take on the Captain America mantle. We'll have to, or if he's just going to use the shield, we'll have to wait and see. Hector Jeter writes, that's America's ass, John. I got to tell you what, if I read that on paper, there's a few moments in Endgame that I said, if I read that in the script, I would have gone, that's not going to work. But then it totally worked on the screen when he says that, that's America's ass. I got to admit, that was hilarious. And then when Cap later looks at his, him, himself laying down, he's like, that is America's ass. I, that was great. All right. Uh, Trolls writes, Cap using Mjolnir made sense, but him using lightning did not. In Ragnarok, Odin specifically says Thor is god of thunder. Yes, but remember, in the first Thor movie, as Odin is stripping Thor of his power and taking Mjolnir away from him, he whispers the enchantment on Mjolnir. That's basically the enchantment that only the worthy, only somebody worthy can wield this hammer. But in that enchantment, he says... Whoever wields this hammer, be they worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. Remember, that's the enchantment. If you are worthy to wield Mjolnir, you get the power of Thor. What does that all exactly mean? I'm not sure, but that is what the enchantment that the Allfather put on the damn thing, right? So... Yeah, I thought that totally worked. So on that level, it totally made sense to me. Uh, Ab616 writes, Peter back to school equals friends are five years older now. Remember, Peter's not the only one who dusted. Other kids dusted too. So my assumption, and I could be wrong, my assumption here is that MJ, Ned, and uh, Flash, they all dusted too. Since they're all together and they're all the same age, I'm just going to assume they all dusted at the same time and then they all came back at the same time. Because Peter's not the only kid in high school. Remember, 50% of everybody got dusted. So what's to say Ned and MJ and all them didn't get dusted too? So that's my assumption. We'll find out as we get closer to Far From Home if that's the way they actually played it out. Or maybe MJ is five years older now. Maybe Ned is five years older now. But I think the way they're going to play it is that they also dusted at the same time. Uh <clears throat> Let's see. Ab616 writes, For me, it's an almost perfect movie. Some time travel issues, though. Cap staying with Carter equals no SSR shield. Then, the, yeah, then come in the lame cop-out things. No, it's multidimensional and does this and this and this. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Just admit, doing time travel is tough narratively, and we're going to create some inconsistencies. I almost find, I, I have a much easier time just forgiving that than... Uh, some desperate attempt to really come up with these really convoluted, no, look, he creates a new reality here, which 
spawns a reality here, which does this, and then it does this, and blah, 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 and see, it's not inconsistent. No, it's it's inconsistent. Now it's just inconsistent and convoluted at the same time. But whatever. It was too much freaking fun to care. I don't care. That's the bottom line. I don't care. Uh, Hector Jeter writes, love Nebulous Ark in this. Always was a fan of her. You know what? They really took a, a truly secondary character in the MCU up until this point and made her a truly important character in this movie. I thought it was interesting. Obviously, in the comics, at some point, Nebula gets her hand on the gauntlet, but I, this isn't the comics. I always thought it was a very interesting choice that she was still around. And they gave her a very important role to play in the film. And I thought um, Karen Gillan was so good in this movie. She might have been the best. She might have given the best performance in the movie as Nebula. I, I really thought she was great and maybe even a little bit underrated. Benny95 writes, the one thing still bothering me is how Stormbreaker beat a fully functioning Infinity Gauntlet yeah, um, with six stones, and yet in Endgame, he couldn't overpower Thanos with both Mjolnir and Stormbreaker. Hey, listen, Benny, look, I, I've said a couple times, I, I agree. That does seem odd. That does seem weird. And that does seem radically inconsistent. Um, you know, <clears throat> in Infinity War... Thanos blasts at Thor with a fully stoned up Infinity Gauntlet that ripped a moon apart. He blasted at Thor with that. Thor just one toss of Stormbreaker, cuts through the Infinity Gauntlet's blast like butter, and wedges itself deep into Thanos' chest. One shot knockout, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we come into Endgame. Thor has Stormbreaker and Mjolnir and Iron Man and Captain America with a Thanos with no Infinity Gauntlet and no Infinity Stones. On paper, that should be fairly easy. And yet, it goes radically inconsistent from Infinity War. What I'll say for it, though, is this. Is that, <clears throat> remember, Thor is not in top shape. He hasn't had combat in five years. For five years, he has sat on his ass on a couch doing nothing, but wallowing in depression and self-pity. You go five, I don't care if you're George St. Pierre, you go five years without so much as using a speed bag and then suddenly try to jump into a fight, you're not going to be the same guy. And... Yes, it's still Stormbreaker, but it's also the guy wielding Stormbreaker, right? So to me, that's what I as an audience member, that's how I resolved that inconsistency in my head, is that Thor is not the Thor he was five years ago. Thor is an angry as Guardian with, with some power, but he hasn't done anything in five years. To say he's rusty and out of practice is an understatement. So... I get it, Benny. I have had the exact same thoughts, believe me, over and over again. But the way I, as a fan, resolve that is the whole issue of Thor is just completely rusty. Completely rusty, out of practice, and not nearly the Thor he was five years ago. Because he hasn't done anything. So that's the way I kind of resolve that myself. But maybe I'm just making excuses in my head because I enjoyed it so much. Um, Ganesh... Prab, Prabhu writes, I cried during the epic battle because it brought so much joy and cried during the silence after the snap. Love the Russos for this love letter to the MCU. Man, there were, I didn't cry ever in the movie, but I had several neck tension moments like I, where you feel the emotion building up, but it was always on these big highlight moments. I got the neck tension when Cap got Mjolnir. I got the neck tension when he yelled, Avengers Assemble. I got the neck tension. Honestly, one of my favorite parts, and I don't know why, if you had told me about this in advance, I wouldn't have thought it was a big deal. But when they do it on screen, for some reason, it had huge effect on me. When Pepper shows up and Pepper and Tony are, are back to back in the air, each in their iron armor, like going in circles back to back, taking out like enemies left, right, and center. I don't know why, man. I got the chills when I saw that. And if you had told me about it in advance, I would have gone, no big deal. So what? So Pepper's got iron armor. Who cares? But there was something about seeing it that was just, like I said, chilling. I'm getting I'm getting massive goosebumps 
right now just thinking about it. it really gave me the chills and i love that a lot um Ab616 writes, nobody will mention her, but I'd like to congratulate and thank Sarah Finn for the incredible slash perfect casting over those 10 years from Robert Downey Jr. to Pfeiffer. Um, and yeah, I guess she's the, the casting director there. And I believe, you know what's funny? I might not be remembering this correctly, but I think, do you guys remember a bunch of years ago when I was still at AMC? I had... Kevin Feige and Chris, Chris Pratt and James Gunn come in to do an interview in the studio. And we made this big live event out of it. Anyway, I believe they, of course, brought a bunch of people along with them. And I think Sarah Finn was one of them because I remember James talking about how they went ahead and got Chris Pratt. Now, James got to make the final decision, which would have had to have been approved, of course, by Kevin Feige. But I guess he was talking about how Sarah Finn kept telling him, I want you to meet with Chris Pratt. And at first, James Gunn thought, nah, I don't, I don't want to meet with Chris Pratt. He's, he's not the right guy for it um, to play Star-Lord. And I, because I think James Gunn was looking at, actually, I think he was looking at uh, Zachary Levi, who went on to play Shazam. I believe like one of the big finalists for Star-Lord was Zachary Levi. And I think James Gunn was really looking at Levi. Anyway, and then he mentioned, but then he met with Chris and he's like, no, Chris is the Chris is Star Lord. Then he went with that, and he was talking about Seraphin, and he gave all the credit in the world Seraphin to getting him to meet with them, and and the rest was history. So good for bringing that up, man. Hector Jeter writes, "How do you think Cap was able to return the Soul Stone? Do you think returning it would bring back uh, who was sacrificed? Doubt, doubt it, but curious. Again, it's this whole convoluted, but you know, each time jump is a different reality, and blah blah. Okay, whatever. Anyway." That's a big question to me because unlike where Tony got his stone from, we know it's in the basement of that facility in this safe. Just got to drop it back in there. There, no problem. Know where it is. Know where I got to put it back. Where the hell do you put the soul stone back? You never see where the soul stone is. You know, Black Widow dies and Clint just wakes up in the middle of a very shallow lake with it in his hand magically. Where do you put it back? Mm. Better question. How'd Cap even get to Vormir considering that um, Clint and Black Widow had to take the Benatar, had to take a ship to fly there? You know, how, how's that work? I don't know. And on top of all that, Considering how complicated it would be to get some of these places, some of these stones back into the exact place they were from the moment that they took them, it would take more than a one person job. And yet they only sent cap. You should have, they would have sent a team considering how important it is that they all get put back in the exact same place. It was going to cause this big catastrophe. They send one guy and they never even remotely explain how he's, how he even plans to try to return the soul stone considering where do you put it back? But we overlook it because the experience was awesome and we don't really care. Um, Paul writes, until this movie, my favorite MCU performance by an actress was Haley Atwell in the first Avenger. Now it's Scarlett Johansson in this one for me. You know, Scarlett Johansson, this was her Picasso. This was her best performance in the franchise so far. But I'm telling you, Karen Gilliam, if, if that's her right name, Gilliam, is that how you pronounce her? Anyway, who played Nebula, I'm telling you what, that was right up there too. I'm not sure I wouldn't put her above Scarlett Johansson. And Joe Scarlett was great in this, absolutely. But man, Karen was on point in this one, man. Like two amazing performances. Two absolutely amazing performances. Hector Jeter writes, thanks to the rat, the universe is saved. Again, I get it. But every once in a while, you need a lucky break, you know? Look, honestly, when I look back at the path of my career, um, a lot of the times I make my own luck, just like that. that's what most of us do. We make our own luck. We make our own opportunities. And a lot of it is that. But there were a couple of times along the way that I think I got a little lucky. I got a lucky break. You know, I think back to this one time, actually, that, you know, the movie blog was no longer because of a big change in Google and all that kind of stuff. The movie blog, which was my blog at the time, wasn't making enough money really for me to live off of anymore because of some some big things that happened to my site. Like my, my site, even because I was doing something wrong that I didn't even know was wrong. And I got 
uh, ads banned from my site for a while. I got them back because I corrected the situation and they understood what went wrong. But then the the income levels went down to about half and I didn't really know what I was going to do. And then all of a sudden, this company came along like just at the right time and said, we're actually interested in buying the movie blog from you, hiring you on to keep running the movie blog, and we want to move you to L.A. That was a lucky break. All of us need a rat on the control panels every once in a while. And I'm okay that the Avengers needed theirs too. Uh, Martin Edwards writes, really great conclusion to the stories. Can't wait to share the MCU with my baby when grown. Great sharing experience. It really is. Thanks, uh, Kevin Feige, for your vision come true. Honestly, you know, this morning, uh, I'm recording this on Tuesday, April the 30th. And this morning on the John Campus Show, I think it was today, Robert mentioned that at some point, Kevin Feige is going to get the honorary Oscar. And I said, absolutely. Like, not in the next couple of years, because they usually like to wait a little while to give that thing out, but he's going to get it. What he has done here at the MCU, Martin, is unprecedented and unbelievable. Unprecedented and unbelievable. And it's magnificent what he did. Uh, Matthew Bortolusi writes, uh, Howard the Duck is in the assemble scene with the Ravagers. I keep, I've heard some people tell me that. I haven't seen it yet myself. But then again, it took me to my fourth screening before I saw Meek or, um, yeah, Meek and uh, and Korg. Because <coughs> I didn't see them the first couple times either. And then, oh, then everybody told me they were in the scene. Then I followed them. I still haven't seen Howard the Duck myself yet, but I've had tons of you guys tell me about that. I don't like Howard the Duck, but it's pretty awesome that he was in that scene. Uh, Sam Shaw writes, saw it three times opening day before the midnight screening began. I turned to my friend who I've watched all the MCU movies with and said, first snap, oh, that's cool, man. And again, it was really awesome going to that press screening at the Disney lot and taking Robert Meyer Burnett with me because he went to the Disney lot for the first press screening of Avengers Infinity War, and he was John Schnepp's plus one. And then this year he was mine. And it was, we, he and I went to lunch before we went to the Disney lot for that screening. We talked a little bit about that. And it was, uh, it was really special. It was really special that I got to be a part of that. Um, ben Book KH2 writes, saying I cried became a spoiler. <laughs> saying I cried became a spoiler. There you go, Ben. Uh, Darth Suthius writes, I got emotional with Tony steps off ship for a split second, thinks Pepper is gone, but she steps into view and hugs him. I'm married. I can totally relate. Yeah. When he came off and he's talking, first of all, I don't know how Tony wouldn't have, how Tony wouldn't have seen her. It's not like she was behind a wall. She was in his direct line of sight. So I don't know how he didn't see her, but when he says, I lost a kid, uh, I, I couldn't stop him. I couldn't either. I lost a kid. Tony, we lost is, and he was about to ask Cap if Pepper was dust or not. And then she comes into frame again. It's a little bit silly because we already know she's standing there in the open, right in his eye line, but still it made for a very, very nice moment. It, it was a great moment in the movie. And I really did like that. Uh, Dave Atkins writes, Seen the MCU films with my big sister since Avengers. Been such an amazing shared experience over the years and seeing it culminate into this joy fest. And that's one of the really cool things, Dave. You know, I've been talking, I've talked for years about, but particularly since Endgame came out, about the fact that, you know, the greatest thing about movies is when they're shared experiences. And I've been hearing for, from people and viewers over the last little while about how, hey, I went to see the first Iron Man when I was eight and my dad took me with a couple of his friends and their friends' kids. And me and those kids have been watching MCU movies together ever since. Now we're like 19 years old and we went just to go see Endgame together. Like, that's ridiculously awesome. It, it's The movies are great, but it's the shared experiences that they help create that are the most special things. And for you to be able to share that with your sister is awesome. I get something like that myself. When new Star Wars movies comes out in December's, I go home for the Christmas break. I take my mom to go see those things and other family members as well. And it's just awesome. So that's awesome, Dave. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. Uh, Dave also writes, my cinema, I was the loudest. Screamed when Cap wielded me on air like it was Sunday's breakfast. Made my imaginary pacemaker go off. Love you, Cap. It was awesome. And what was as extra special for me was while some of you guys did speculate that we were going to see Cap with Mjolnir in this movie this guy didn't I didn't think we were going to see that 
just because Mjolnir was destroyed. So I, I really didn't think we were going to see it. So to see it when I didn't expect it made it all the more joy gasmy for me. Adding on top of the fact that Cap is my favorite character in the MCU. Not, not in the comics, but in the MCU is my favorite. And it just added to my overall pure joy and glee, Dave. Pure joy and glee. Um, Dave again writes, Movie solidified Rocket as my favorite MCU character next to Cap and Bucky. Had some of the best lines in humor, but also an anchor to the Thor, to Thor, etc. Yeah, very much so. Natural leader, smart, methodical, and plain kick-ass. You know, a lot of people forget that also Rocket is a genius. Remember in the first Guardians of the Galaxy when he orchestrated the escape from the prison asteroid? He is a level one genius. He can make bombs out of spare parts laying around. Like, that's why I love the line. You know, I was complaining a little bit about, okay, I'm sorry, but Tony's a part of the human race on the Earth, which is thousands of years more primitive technology-wise than a lot of other planets that he can just magically make. Oh, I'll just make an infinity gauntlet of my own. Do, 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 magic. That's frustrating. It was really cool to me that they put in the one line when, uh, I can't remember what he called Rocket, but he called Rocket some some wrong name, and Rocket's like, take it easy, pal, you're only a genius on Earth. I love that he said that. I love that he said that. That was great, and I love Rocket, and especially the one scene that just made me laugh my guts out was when Tony and Bruce are doing all the calculations and putting the stone into the new Iron Gauntlet, and then it's in, there's this tension, and Rocket's like, Boo! Everybody jumps. I love that when he slaps Thor. I, I am. I've always liked Groot in the movies, but I'm with you on that, Dave. I've my appreciation for him has just grown with Endgame like a whole lot. Uh, Caesar Rivera writes. I feel like Thanos should have felt the power of the stones disappear from his hand when Tony takes them. Still love that moment though. Uh, th still love that moment. Thoughts? Um, you're not wrong. I mean, considering that what what power surge go the ah, that both him and Hulk go through when the stones are in there, you would have thought that if they were suddenly not on him, that he would have noticed. Yeah, yeah, he would have noticed. But it made for a great moment when we we're oh no, he's about to snap. I am inevitable. Boop, and then nothing. That's an example of what I was talking about a little bit earlier, where. I'm okay with some conflicts and some inconsistencies and some, quite frankly, plot holes. If the payoff of those inconsistencies and plot holes was a great moment in the film that gave me a great experience, that one was one of them. Because that moment when he snapped, I really thought, oh my God, what are they going to do now? And then you realize there's nothing in there. That was a great moment. That was a tension-filled moment in the movie, made possible by a tiny little inconsistency in the movie that... Hey, Thor would have known, or Thanos would have noticed that the stones were gone. He would have felt that. But, ah, eh, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. The payoff was a great moment, a tension-filled moment in the movie that I really enjoyed. All right. Dave Atkins writes, uh, That battle, Spidey activating insta-kill, T'Challa kicking ass with his kinetic blast, Pepper owning bad guys as rescue, everybody witnessing it all, um... Uh, uh, Dave Akins, he continues with eternal thank you to the Russo brothers for this amazing epic cry time spectacle. The final battle got me so emotionally swept up. I mean, it was just a 37 minute orgasm. I mean, if you can imagine such a thing, it was, and it's not just the battle, that entire final hour. I've said this before. I will say it again to me, that entire final hour of the movie is simply the greatest single hour in the history of the comic book genre. Now, everybody knows it's well documented. I thought the first two acts were were some great highs, but also some problematic areas, kind of even it out. Made the first two acts kind of mediocre, middle of the road, okay. The first two acts are okay. Some amazing moments, some problematic moments. But it's all negated by this full hour at the end of the movie that just delivered on everything you could have possibly wanted from a movie like this. And like the Spidey activating insta-kill... And, but still, I can do it. I, oh, I'm not, this isn't going to work. And then, you know, Cap throws Mjolnir that he can then catch on to. I mean, it's just scene after scene after scene after scene was just so climactic. It was like a 37-minute orgasm. Hard to imagine that, though. All right. Uh, at least keep moving on here. Darth Suthius writes, 
I love how ruthless Thanos was. Very different from Infinity War. Love seeing his uh, epiphany of needing to start completely over rather than just life balance. And one of the other things that I think they did in this movie with Thanos was to highlight he's evil. I remember having some debates with some people after Infinity War about some people saying to me, John, Thanos isn't evil. You know, he he thinks he's doing the right thing. He's trying to save the universe. And what I was trying to express to people is like, look, every villain is the hero of their own story. Every villain sees themselves as the good guy, other than maybe the Joker. But most good villains are the ones who see themselves as the good guy and that their ends justify their means. I say, don't forget, this is the same guy who went to Neva Delir and slaughtered all of Peter Dinklage's fellow dwarves. Even though he made it seem like, oh, if you build this a gauntlet, I'll let them live. Up, oh, slaughter them all anyway. You know, this is the same Thanos who's like, I, he's not just about balance. Just because, you know, um, Heimdall helped Hulk get away off the ship at the beginning of Infinity War, Thanos had a bitterness and spite went, that was a mistake, and he drives a spear through his heart and kills him. That wasn't about balance in the universe. Thanos is pure evil. His own daughters know he's evil. Nebula, a girl he claims as a daughter, he tortured and manipulated and ripped apart and terrorized her whole life. Even Gamora was like, this is a madman. This guy's evil. And <clears throat> I almost felt like in Endgame, it almost felt to me like the Russo brothers picked up on the fact that some people are misunderstanding Thanos a bit, maybe not understanding he really is evil. And it's like they wanted to make sure that that was clear. And in this movie, they made it pretty clear. He's not just some madman who wants balance. He's evil. He thinks he's good. He doesn't understand why everybody else doesn't see it his way. But at the heart of it, he's an evil maniac. And, and they kind of highlight that a little bit. And, and that was also highlighted, Darth, in what you were saying about him. I'm going to shred this universe down to its last atom. There you go. Um, let's see. Sveen86 writes, if Stanley had appeared in Tony's funeral cry time. Yeah. I mean, look, was it the best? It wasn't the best Stanley cameo that we've seen in all of the MCU. We've seen better Stanley cameos, but it didn't matter. I said before the movie came out, and, and it's true still, the Stanley cameo could have been Captain America walking down a sidewalk in a neighborhood one day and looking over it, it could have been just Stanley sitting in a lawn chair scratching his balls, and we all still would have loved it. It still would have been great because it's the Stanley cameo, right? We all still would have bought into it completely and loved it and adored it and all that kind of stuff, rightfully so. But yeah, if he had popped up at uh, Tony's funeral, that would have been pretty special. Uh, Darth Suthius writes, uh, because of my schedule with family, I won't be able to see this again until home release. Hopefully, I'll be able to see Far From Home at least once in cinema. I hope you do, man. And now I am more curious than ever, Darth. I mean, we were always curious about Far From Home, but now I'm super curious about it. Like, Endgame, a lot of people would, would say to me, hey, where does the MCU go after Endgame? And it's like, after seeing Endgame, we still have no idea. I think it's going to be far from home that kind of lets us know, gives us some insight into what the MCU is going to be like now moving forward. It's going to be far from home that gives us that inclination. And so I hope you get out to see it too, Darth. Uh, Darth also follows up with, I was fine with the rat. In life, there will be randomness and conveniences. It took five years for one rat to accidentally activate a van. Very acceptable. I'm with you on that. Like I said, it's not like he got trapped trapped in the quantum realm and five minutes later, a pigeon landed on the, on the console and poof, he's back, right? It took five years and then they caught a lucky break and lucky breaks are life. And every once in a while, lucky break propels the, the plot forward, right? Hey, you want to talk lucky break? Let's talk Star Wars. What about R5? The little red droid, the little uh, red droid. Remember, Uncle Owen picked the red droid instead of R2. R2 was about to be left behind. And since because the the uh, the red one, R5 had a bad motivator that blew psh, because of that lucky break. Uncle Owen said, fine, I'll take that one and took R2-D2, keeping C-3PO and R2 together, getting them introduced to Luke and then the rest of Star Wars history. That was a lucky break. Sometimes 
even heroes need a lucky break to propel the narrative a little bit forward. Uh, Patrick Finch writes, the Cap Peggy love story transcended time, the breadth of the galaxy, the power of the of gods, and death itself. His story ending with them dancing to It's Been a Long, Long Time had me in man tears. It was a nice moment. I may have had some issues with how they brought it all about and everything like that, but again, the payoff of it. It was a beautiful moment. Cap finally with Peggy, and then thinking back fondly to making out with his niece, Sharon Carter. <laughs> that's all I can think about now is that scene in Civil War when he starts making out with Sharon Carter and now all I can picture is Sharon Carter going oh Uncle Steve it's very disturbing but it is uh, nonetheless what it is uh, okay Ali Hussein writes I believe uh, the next Avengers movie is coming in 2024 maybe there there were foreshadowing that in five years time skip what do you guys think no I don't think there was any foreshadowing there I, I don't think look it's very possible that the next Avengers movie could be in 2024. But even if it is, I think that's coincidental to the five-year time jump. I don't, I don't honestly don't think that was foreshadowing at all. Uh, Ali follows up with, uh, do you guys think the Black Widow movie is going to be a prequel? See, this is what we were talking about before. I have a suspicion, nobody's told me this, this is not inside information. I have a suspicion that the Black Widow movie takes place in the five years between the snap and Infinity War and when Endgame picks up. I think that would be a fascinating five years to see our player as she kind of takes over the leadership of the Avengers because I guess Cap has kind of stepped aside, I guess. But she's kind of running things from the headquarters there now. I think it might be in there. Now, it could be previous to that, but I think that's where we're going to see it. I could be wrong, though. I'm, I'm not really sure about that, obviously. Uh, Gino Montgomery writes, I was hoping for a Hulk versus Thanos rematch. Dude, take a number. You ain't the only one, Gino. There were a lot of us hoping to see that. There were a lot of, at least show us Hulk wrecking some fools. We never got to see Hulk fight. We got to see him running into the battle with everybody, but we never got to see him fight. And that, to me, was always very unsatisfying. Um, Caleb Kaiser writes, The only reason Tony switched the stones from Thanos because it was his technology, his nanotech. That's the only way. Yeah, again, it's still ridiculous that he was able to make the tech in the first place, that was nonsense. That's nonsense. But the payoff to the nonsense was awesome, so I'm fine with it. I can live with it. But yeah, that, that makes sense too. Again, to the previous question's point though, Thanos still would have felt that difference, right? Like if you're wearing them and you go, then when they're suddenly gone, you, you would probably feel that. But yep, I, I mean, that does explain it. I get why Tony was able to slip them out because that's his tech in the glove. And he's slipping into his again his own tech. I get that. That's fine. Even though it's ridiculous that he is able to create tech that can harness the power of the stones when nobody else in the universe except a magic giant dwarf in the center of the universe forged in the heart of a dying star can do it. But oh, Tony Stark? Yeah, magic, 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 magic. Tony Stark can just magically do it. It, that, that's silly. It's stupid. But you know what? It's a convenience that furthered the story and gave us some great moments. So I'm a-okay with it. I wouldn't trade it. Uh, Ali Hussein writes, uh, one of two, holy shit, the last battle was freaking awesome when all they heroes was fighting Thanos' army, when Captain America used Mjolnir and said Avengers Assemble. That was a geek out moment. Dude, it is, it's, it's almost impossible to put into words. From the moment that Cap straps on his shield standing alone against the armies of Thanos, and then you hear on your left, that moment on became, as I've described, a 37 minute long orgasm. It's just, and include uh, highlighted, of course, by the Mjolnir moment, dude. I mean, that that was just something we're going to be having geeky wet dreams about for a long, long time. That's going to be a hard cap getting Mjolnir is going to be a hard moment for any comic book movie. I don't care if you're. Uh, Sony, I don't care if you're Warner Brothers, I don't care if you're Marvel. That's going to be a hard moment to ever top because that was just crazy, man. Just crazy. Um, Allie writes, uh, is Gamora dusted or is she alive? She's alive. She just disappeared after helping Peter and Quill. Does that mean that in Guardians 3 is going to focus on finding Gamora? And by the way, is Thor joining the Guardians of the Galaxy 3? So basically Gamora in the original timeline is really dead. Look, to me, that, that's all just semantics. 
Gamora's dead, now Gamora's back. I don't care what semantics you use. I don't care what technicalities you say. No, it's not really Gamora. That Gamora's dead, but this is a different Gamora. Cut the BS. Gamora was dead, now Gamora's back. That's not really Loki, at least not the one we... That's the different dimensions. Look, Cut the BS. Loki was dead, now Loki's back. I mean, how, whatever way you want to slice this pickle, it's still a pickle, right? It's still that. Um, yeah, Gamora didn't dust. Gamora just split. That's why when we see Peter on the Benatar again, he's got that thing up with a picture of Gamora saying, searching, searching, searching. Gamora split after she need him in the balls. That was How great was that, by the way? And she split and... Yeah, that could foreshadow that part of Guardians 3 is going to be about, you know, the search for Spock. It's going to be the search for Gamora. That could be it. And yeah, it does kind of look like uh, we've got uh, Chris Hemsworth is going to be playing Thor in Guardians 3. At least that's what they imply. And if that's the case, that guess what? That means Chris Hemsworth signed a new contract. And we could probably expect a Thor 4 at some point and probably have Taika Waititi dropping it. Again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but that is what they seem to imply in all that, Ali. Uh, okay. Richard Karate uh, writes... Wow, there's a lot of part ones and parts two in here. Uh, Richard Karate writes, part one. Tried to see Endgame last night. My locus cinema is a 12-screen cinema. Endgame was showing for 24 hours on eight screens of the 12, and I arrived at 5 p.m., uh, was then queuing till 7.30 p.m., arrived at the ticker counter to be told all eight screens are sold out till the 3 a.m. showing, so me and my friends had to go to 3 a.m. this morning, but it was totally worth every minute. Again, kind of dark ages kind of stuff. Richard, you should have just been able... I mean, but theaters, there are still some backwards theaters that do not allow you to just get your tickets online, be set, you're ready to go, you know when you're going. But this is one of those times, Richard, as you're kind of pointing out, this is one of those times where it's like, yeah, I'm willing to stand in the damn line. This is one of those times where it's like, yeah, I'm willing to put up with all the BS. This is one of those times where you're like, yeah, I'm willing to just stand in the line an unreasonable amount of time because it's Avengers Endgame and I'm glad you had a great experience, man. I'm glad you liked the movie because I would have sucked if you went through all that and it didn't end up being good for you. That would have sucked. All right, Ali Hussein writes, uh, one or two, some stuff was not making any sense. Like, how the hell can Stark Technology hold Infinity Stones? How did Tony switch Infinity Stones with Thanos? Well, again, I, somebody mentioned earlier, I think it is Tony's tech. That explains how he's able to switch them. So I'm okay with that. But I do agree it was just a real stretch of logic and believability. An Earth guy is still just an Earth guy. He can be the most brilliant Earth guy. And by the way, Tony's not even the smartest guy in the MCU. Sure he is. They, the, they've already confirmed that. Kevin Feige said that. Sure he's the smart. So sure he's, Tony's not even the smartest guy on the planet. Right? And yet he, an Earth guy, a technologically still primitive society compared to a lot of the universe, can in 24 hours build something that nobody else in the galaxy can do other than a magic giant dwarf in the center of the universe forged in the heart of a dying star. But Tony Stark with his magic nanotech can make it, yes, that is ridiculous. But again, we accept it because if it were not for that, we wouldn't have had the payoff of all the great moments, right? But I get you that that I'm, I'm totally on board with you on that, Ali. That's a major inconsistency. All right. Sean writes, what time travel plot holes? You mean all the cash we'll make when new Disney Plus shows? Welcome to the multiverse, everybody. Yep, that's pretty much it, Sean. That's pretty much it. Plot holes, schmot holes, whatever. It's kind of like the old Fox. Continuity, schmottinuity. Uh, it is going to be interesting. And look, again, I'm okay overlooking plot holes if you give me something really worth it. Getting a Loki show is really worth it to me. And I'm excited about it. Again, it's fake, the Marvel fake death universe. I get it, but I, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I was pretty excited to see that Loki show. I really am. Rootshot writes, when Loki escaping, will a new timeline be created? Uh, again, it, it's inconsistent and you're going to get inconsistent answers. At the end of the day, it does kind of feel a little bit like Marvel is looking at Fox and going, wow, Fox's whole continuity schmontinuity thing worked for them. 
maybe we can adopt a little bit of continuity schmontinuity. And then if anything doesn't make sense, just say alternate reality. And then that fixes everything. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know what they're going to do with that. But I'm just excited to see the Loki show rude shot. All right. Dashi writes. Um, this is Alex helping Dashi with these super chats. You just want to say he's grateful for the support of the fan community. We loved Endgame. Awesome to hear Dashi and awesome to hear Alex. Make sure you, uh, as always, you give our best to Dashi. Uh, AB loves movies, writes, this may not be the best movie ever or the best movie in the MCU, but it definitely is the best fan service that has been provided ever. I, I, that's hard to argue against, AB. That's really hard to argue against. Look, a lot of this movie was pure fan service but in all the best ways possible. If you're defining fan service as, let's just give the fans a big heap and dose of what they've been wanting to see, then yeah, it's fan service. And it worked gloriously. It worked gloriously. My God. And you're right. Is it the best movie ever? No. Is it even the best MCU movie? No. I mean, that's all subjective. I'm sure there's some people feel it. For me, it's the number five MCU movie out of the 22. But... Man, they just, as a big thank you to the fans who've supported them for the 21 previous movies, they give us this experience that is just like, here you go, folks. Thank you. And they gave it this big, glorious feast of fan service to just feast on and enjoy and glutton ourselves on and walk out short of breath, exhausted, exhilarated, the whole bit. It's, it's just great. I really like the way you actually describe that, A.B. All right. Uh, Sean writes, Tony starts as selfish billionaire playboy, ends by making the ultimate sacrifice. Steve would sacrifice anything to serve, ends by making a selfish choice. Interesting juxtaposition of our two leads. Well, I mean... <clears throat> I don't know about that. I mean, at the end, the Tony thing, absolutely. That was his character arc, and that was beautifully handled. Remember, Tony or Steve only decided to do something after he fulfilled his duty. Like, it's not like Steve said, I'm not going to perform my duty. I'm going to go and get something for me. No. First, he fulfilled his duty. He fulfilled his duty. The Infinity Saga's over. He did the cleanup, returned the stones. However, he returned the soul stone. He returned the stones. Thanos, the biggest threat in the universe, is now gone. The five-year nightmare of the dusted was now erased. The world is now set right. Now that my, my watch is done, to use Game of Thrones terms, terms, he was like, now my watch is ended. Now I can rest. And... So it wasn't as if he made a selfish choice in spite of doing his duty. First, he did his duty, and then he retired. But I, I agree. There was really interesting character arcs with both these characters throughout, and it was really neat to see how they brought those to resolution in Endgame. Uh, Doshi writes, uh, after the movie, I got some cheeseburgers. That's no, I, Like, seriously, no kidding. As soon as she goes, cheeseburgers, I'm like, okay, damn it. Now I want cheeseburgers. Now, anybody else want some cheeseburgers now? Can we go hit, like, Five Guys or something after this is done? <clears throat> or Steak and Shake, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't blame you, dude, because I was kind of feeling the same way myself. Uh, AJ Canos writes, Besides the cool cameos of Joe Russo in the support group with Cap, they included Jim Starlin, yep, the creator of Thanos and writer of Infinity Gauntlet in Comic Book. Yeah, he was the older, bald guy in the same support group. And by the way, this wasn't the first time Joe Russo made an appearance. He was also in Winter Soldier. He was also in Civil War. In Winter Soldier, he was the doctor that was taking care of, um, of Nick Fury, when they all gather back and they realize Nick Fury is still alive, Joe played the doctor who was taking care of him. And in Civil War, he's the scientist who gets murdered by Zemo and left in the bathtub. That was him too. So he's appeared in the other ones along the way. But yeah, that one with Jim Starlin was a really good one for them to point to uh, to have in there. Uh, Caledon Sound writes, was the post credit stinger an Iron Man death knell? The last metal hit drops in tone, which usually sig signifies passing. I just kind of, I didn't interpret that way, but you may be 100% on the mark there. I just interpreted it on a more simple level that it was just a homage to Tony in that cave forging the first Iron Man outfit, the, the Mach 1. 
that clang, clang. That's how I interpreted it, but you could be completely on the money with that, Caledon, because you're not the only one that thinks that. Uh, Caledon also follows up with, in Far From Home, half of the kids from Midtown High will be five years older than the rest. Yep. But also, those kids will have graduated by now, right? Because it's been five years. That's more than a career in high school. High school's four years. Uh, some places five, but most of them will now be moved on. So you're going to get half the kids now starting back at school with a new group of kids. All those other ones should now be in college and gone. So that's why I think Ned and MJ and Flash and all them, I think they also got dusted or else they would have been out of high school by now and probably on to college. So that's my guess at any rate. Uh, Caledon follows up with, uh, let's see, a little bit out of order here. Or uh, Sorry, Caledon. Uh, how then did Steve go back in time and end up in our reality as an old timer cap? Contradicts the rules set above. Well, you no, know, it does. And what the Russo brothers have gotten on Reddit, and they've tried now, they're doing damage control on Reddit, call it what it is. And what they're saying now is, Steve, our Steve, went back, hooked up, did all the things with the stones, however he returned the soul stone, however he did it all by himself, when before it took an entire team of people breaking into three teams to get it done, but whatever. Hooked up with Peggy, lived to 2016 when Peggy died, and then used his time machine to come back to our era. And that's where we see him sitting on the bench. Now, again, that feels to me like damage control. It also contradicts the other stuff they set up that they need the time machine. Listen, the way if, for that to work means that they never needed the time machine in the first place. At the beginning, they needed the time GPS, but they needed the quantum entrance to go in and then come out at the right time, right? Their explanation for what Steve did completely contradicts that whole setup that they had with the time machines, for lack of a better term, the quantum machines, the quantum realm uh, entrances. Because in everything else, that's how they had to go in and start the time travel. And then when they came back, they came back at the time machine again. That's where they got pulled back to. What they're saying was what Steve did completely contradicts that. So it's either contradicting one way or it's contradicting the other way. But either way, there's this contradiction there. Um, Sedek 13 writes, The final scene with Cap staying in the past made no logical sense to me considering the time travel rules that were established. I know, I agree. But goddamn, I don't care. I also don't care. Uh, Cap has earned this ending and his dance with Peggy. Such a beautiful ending and send off. It is, look. This is what I believe happened. I can't back this up. This is just what I believe happened. Everybody wanted Cap to get his happy ending with Peggy Carter, including Kevin Feige and the Russos. Reality is, there's no way they could do it without it totally screwing up the timeline. So they came up with all these convoluted things to say, Look, he gets his happy ending and it doesn't mess up our timeline. Huh? Huh? We get both. We get both. Um, look, just you gave us the ending we wanted Cap to have. That's all we need to know. We're super happy about it. That's fine. But either way, it's it's either getting consistent one way or inconsistent the other. But bottom line, I'm with you. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn because the payoff was worth whatever consistency it cost us to get that payoff. And I'm totally fine with it. I'm totally fine with it because it was a great ending. Uh, Kobe Porter writes, wait a second, where am I at here? Uh, Kobe Porter writes, uh, do you think Thor being out of shape affected his fighting ability? Absolutely it did because he should have easily killed Thanos alone. Also, Hail Hydra, a great moment. No, that that's my feeling, Kobe. Uh, absolutely. At least that's how I as a fan in my mind is resolving that apparent discrepancy between the fight in Infinity War and the fight now is that, hey, dude, Dude's been sitting on a couch for five years. He ain't the same Thor. He's just simply not the same Thor. And that is the way, Kobe, exactly the way I kind of resolve it in my own head. Uh, Caledon writes, you can't change your own past, so you can't go back and kill baby Thanos. It wouldn't affect anything. When you mess with the past, it creates a divergent reality with repercussions. Uh, but for that reality, not yours. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the way they set it up. But then that actually doesn't make any sense. Look, again, to me, the bottom line is this. If time travel doesn't affect our present, fine. If Captain America doesn't go back in time to return the stones, then we don't get old man Steve Rogers in our present. Re regardless of whatever machinations you want to say brought it about, 
The fact of the matter is, Steve going back in time affected our present because now our present, wherever he came from, our present has an old man Steve Rogers that simply doesn't exist had our Steve not gone back into the past. Him traveling into the past effectively changed our present. There's no way around. You can say, oh, but he got there by doing whatever machinations you want to pull into play. The bottom line is this. If Steve doesn't go back in time to return the soul stones and go back and stay with Peggy, if that doesn't happen, then our present has no old man Steve Rogers. And lo and behold, now our present has an old man Steve Rogers. Our present was changed. It was which contradicts the laws that they laid up before. But again, we're, we're, I feel like I'm focusing on the negative here. The, the fact of the matter is, like we said before, I'm cool with it. I can live with it because the payoff was so glorious and delicious that I can just totally live with it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ray Arculeta writes, do you think Loki escaping with the Tesseract means that he is alive in the current timeline? They brought Gamora back, so they could bring him back, especially since Loki has a show coming out. I mean, that's that's a big question. Is this new Loki show going to happen in his, whatever that timeline is, and whatever convoluted thing they want to say about new realities and different timelines, is it happened there? Or Gamora's in our timeline now. We got a new Gamora in our timeline who is the same as the other Gamora, just a different version, but exactly the same. So we've got to Gamora back is now in our timeline. Does that somehow ha happen with, the, with Loki? Can the space stone maybe facilitate Loki moving in between dimensions? They, they might say that. They might say that. Um, you know what, Ray? I wasn't thinking that's what they're going to do. But, you know, now that you mentioned it, it is possible. I'll be curious to see how they do that. Uh, Sancho Dangerous writes, underwater crake reference foreshadowing Namor. No, I've had a few people ask me that. No, there was nothing about it. The whole point of that reference was just setting up that Nat is looking for danger everywhere. And there is, hey, a mild earthquake under the ocean, which happens all the time. How are we handling it? Nat, it's an earthquake under the ocean. We handle it by not handling it. It was a small minor turn. Or, no, it wasn't a reference nor foreshadowing to Namor. Marvel still doesn't have the rights fully, doesn't fully have the rights to Namor at this point. So, <clears throat> no, that, but that just because something was in the water doesn't mean it's a reference to, to Namor. Like, it's, it's as if they're in a, a restaurant and somebody over there says, just uh, some other table behind our main character says, can I have a glass of water? <gasps> water? Was that a reference to Namor? No. Just because it's something that happened in the ocean, something that covers three quarters of the earth, does not necessarily mean it was a reference to Namor. So, no, I don't think it was a reference to Namor at all. Not in the least. Uh, AJ Kanos writes, nice nod to include James Darcy Jarvis from the Age of Cards. I, the, I, I was almost sure, but I wasn't 100% sure. I'm like... I think that's the same guy who played Jarvis in Agent Peggy, Peggy Carter. And then later on realized, yes, it absolutely was. I agree with you, AJ. I thought that was a great move to have him in there. That was tying that whole thing together. I did think that was kind of wonderful. Sancho uh, Dangerous writes, Sancho Dangerous writes, do you think the Loki scene and Cap's decision to stay in the past will mean a multiverse for future MCU movies? P.S. Best movie experience of my life. I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I don't know that Kevin Feige will want to go multiverse because that's a little bit alienating to your average moviegoers. And they already asked the average moviegoers to accept a lot in these MCU movies. Is multidimensional stuff really what they want to do? Now, remember, me and Robert talked about this the other day, and, and Robert was talking about how, look, the multidimensional stuff just causes a lot of convoluted problems, so much so that the whole reason the crisis storylines even existed in DC was to get rid of the multiverse stuff because it just was becoming too convoluted and they needed bringing it back. They need to bring, so even in the comics, they realized that creates problems. And I don't know that Kevin Feige is going to want to go down that path, but I don't know that he's not. I certainly haven't talked to Kevin Feige about it. I haven't asked him about it. So it's a possibility. I, I have my reservations that he should, and I have my reservations that he will because he seems to really understand the audience. So I don't think they will, but if he wants to, they certainly open the door for it here. 
Okay, uh, Matt Quack writes, uh, but that rat scene was a little convenient. Again, there's no denying it. It was a total convenience and it was total luck. But every once in a while, we all, including our heroes, need a little bit of luck. We need. We all need a lucky break now and again, and certainly our heroes did in this. But it took five years. It took five years. Uh, Dashi, my theater gasped when we see Tony's daughter. Oh my God, that was so. And by the way, guys, how adorable is that damn little girl? Tell me what's for lunch or be exterminated. I'm like, my God, how cute is that kid? That girl is. Oh, I don't know if that's actually. Robert Downey Jr.'s daughter, or if they just went out and found the universe's most adorable little girl. Uh, but that little kid was so just just adorable, man. Matt Quack writes, Hey guys, uh, love this five-star movie. Cap and Tony are MVPs in 2014. Thanos was badass. Hope they bring back Infinity War Thor for the next Guardians. Oh God, me too. And I'm all for Thor Ragnarok Thor. I'm all for the lighter-hearted, jovial, kind of like the Warriors 3 um, Thor, I'm all for that. Just get rid of the big Lebowski Thor. That I got real tired of real fast. Um, but yes, I'm with you, Mac. I, I thought what they did with Thanos was appropriate. I really do hope they bring back a Ragnarok kind of Thor rather than this uh, big Lebowski Thor. All right. <clears throat> Just got time for a, a few more here, guys. Tyler Freeman writes, If Star-Lord kept his cool for 10 more seconds in Infinity War, Tony Stark would still be alive. Do you think uh, he will feel any sort of guilt? No, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Remember, Doctor Strange said he saw 14,605. I can't remember the exact number. But it was 14,600 and something possible futures, and only one could we all win. That means any possible future where Star-Lord didn't punch Thanos in the face means we lost. Think about that. If there was only one path that led to the Avengers winning, that means Star-Lord punching Thanos in the face was part of that path. And had he not done that, then we lose. We lose. So basically that means... What Doctor Strange saw was that, let's say Star-Lord doesn't punch Thanos in the face, maybe they slip the, the gauntlet off him. But guess what? That means in whatever possible future that, that Doctor Strange saw, Thanos recovers and gets the, the gauntlet back from them, puts it back on, and goes on to victory and wins. There was only one path to victory, and that means everything that happened, including Doctor Strange handing over the Time Stone, including uh, Star-Lord punching him in the face, including... Thanos getting that first snap off in Infinity War. All that had to happen in order to come to the one scenario in which they actually won. And therefore, that had to happen. That had to happen. So, no, there shouldn't be any guilt. It, it happened the way it needed to happen. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Collins N. as Neiman writes pepper giving tony permission to rest had me bawling that was a great line man uh but what a tremendous end to a fantastic character i loved it and that moment with gwyneth paltrow she played it so perfectly like she i'm like why isn't she bawling her eyes out you know why because she wanted to be strong for tony she needed to look tony in the eyes and say we're, we're gonna be okay me and morgan we're gonna be okay we're fine we're all right we're gonna be okay you can rest now. And for her to deliver that line means she, meant she had to be strong. She couldn't be a weepy mess for Tony at that moment. She had to be strong for Tony. And I love the way that Gwyneth Paltrow portrayed that. Remember, Gwyneth Paltrow is an Academy-winning actress. And I think what the way she portrayed that scene was exactly right. And I'm agreeing with you, Collins, that it, it added to the emotional moment of it for me. Rather than her doing the stereotypical, oh, Tony, oh, which would have been fine too. But instead, this is Pepper Potts. She knows Tony's about to die. And for him, she's strong and says, we're going to be okay. You can rest. It's all right. Oh, God, I'm getting chills thinking about it. It, it, was, it was the perfect way to do it. It was absolutely the perfect way to do it, and I, I, I'm with you, man. I just loved it. Lord of Thunder, Prince of Stars writes, I want to see Cap return Soul Stone to Red Skull. And again, where do you put the stone back? 
Where do you put the stone back? That's, that's still a giant, huge question to me. Where do you put the stone back? Um, Lord of Thunder writes, Thor Clint talking about getting Nat back so sad. Oh, it was. Especially when he's getting angry at Thor. It's like, you take your magic hammer, you go fly, and you find the red guy, and you figure it out. I mean, that, that was great. Again, you know, it just brings me to this thing about, it seems like everybody in the Avengers gave the best performance they've ever given in the Avengers in this movie. Robert Downey Jr. was great. Chris Evans was great. Scarlett Johansson was great. Karen Gillan was great. Um, I mean, they were all fantastic. And you're right, that scene when Clint is just getting, like, he's, he's just, he's not mad at Thor. He's just taking it out on Thor. You go ask him. I mean, it was so well done. So well done. Uh, let's see. Dashi writes, I unfortunately got sick for five minutes of the movie and I missed the Thor gag. Luckily, seen the movie twice now. Hashtag May... Mayo on hot dogs. By the way, by the way, my wife looks at me and laughs every time we get to that scene in the movie when Clint Starr looks and goes, who has mayo on hot dogs? This guy. I love mayo on my hot dogs. I love mayo on my burgers. I love mayo on my hot dogs. I'm Canadian. Deal with it. I love that. Uh, but fortunately, too, the Thor gag runs for about two hours in the movie. It gets really overplayed, so you probably didn't miss too much of that, Doshi. All right. Uh, Tongerverse Viking writes, Love Fat Thor. Chris Hemsworth is such a comedic talent. I hope they make a Thor 3, Taika Waititi, or include him in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, James Gunn. Hashtag Chubby God. Well, that would be Thor 4 that you're hoping that they make, because Thor Ragnarok is Thor 3. Um, it does look like, at least they implied, that we're going to see Thor in Guardians of the Galaxy. And again, I was totally cool with Fat Thor because that was a physical representation of where he was emotionally. He was broken. He was wrecked. He was, he had lost hope. He had lost motivation. He had lost his will. And his physical appearance just became a physical manifestation of what was going on internally with Thor. And I thought that was funny at first because this is Thor, the God of Thunder. To see him suddenly unlike what we normally see him as was funny. But also it became a very poignant physical reminder of where he was inside. And that's why that worked for me a lot. All right. Andrew Christie writes, uh, it almost felt like a closing of an era, not just to the MCU, but a period of comic book movies in general. I know we have many more coming, but this was such a peak, kind of like uh, fantasy movies after Return of the King. Kind of. Now, I mean, to me, it's a little bit different because it's not my favorite MCU film. It ranks way up there. Like, to me, it's number five. I thought Infinity War was a little bit better. But just as a conclusion, it felt so appropriate, you know? As a conclusion, as a closing chapter, it just hit all the notes. Not my favorite MCU movie. Uh, certainly right up there. But just on that level alone, as a final chapter of what this opening act of the MCU has been, the Infinity Saga, it was a great conclusion. And it does make you go, where do we go from here? Like, where do we go from here? And you're right to the Lord of the Rings. Like, where do you go with fantasy movies after the ending of Return of the King? Where do you go? What do you do? And that might be part of the reason why we never got this huge influx of sword and sorcery movies after Lord of the Rings. When everybody thought, oh, this is going to throw open the, the floodgates of sword and sorcery movies. But it didn't because I think everyone too is like, where do we go after that? With such a brilliant conclusion, it is natural for us to ask what's next. But guess what? Spider-Man Far From Home is what's next, and it's coming in just a couple of months, and we're going to have it here. All right, Doshi writes, I cried like a baby with Tony's death. A lot of people cried like babies, man. That was a huge emotional moment. Tony Strauss writes, uh, biggest movie payday equals biggest John Campion payday, uh, and my throat is going to pay for it in spades, Troy, massively. Uh, Andrew Christie writes, what a closing of a chapter. My only question is, how does the MCU continue from here? Another 22 movie build up to something that matches this event? Well, this is the thing. I mean, it all depends on where we are personally with this movie. Because again, to me, Endgame wasn't the best movie in the MCU. I think there were four movies that were better in the MCU than Endgame. I thought Infinity War was better. I thought the original Avengers was better. I thought Winter Soldier was a better overall movie. And I thought Civil War was a better overall movie. That's just my opinion. That's not definitive. That's just my opinion. But... Where does it go from here? You know, we, we always feel like when a big movie comes and goes like, oh, where do we go from here? But then the next movie comes, right? 
And we've got one coming in just... We're not going to have to ask the question very long because we've got Spider-Man Far From Home coming. And it is weird to say. I understand it's weird to say. But ultimately, Endgame is just another MCU movie. I know it's totally weird to say that. I know it's a little bit different. It's the closing chapter of the first 22 films. I get that. But at the end of the day, it's just another MCU movie. And we've got the next one coming in two months. A significant one, no doubt. But I and you know, I said on, my, on the John Campus show earlier today, one of the things I said to Rob is, I wonder if we're going to have any kind of a hangover. Like, I, I just wonder with Captain Marvel being number two at the box office, just making a billion dollars. Uh, Avengers Endgame now easily going to clear two billion, maybe even approach three billion. And with the huge emotional expenditure we just all did on the movie, I wonder if there's going to be a little bit of a hangover going into Spider-Man Far From Home. And maybe it might negatively affect Spider-Man Far From Home. I still believe Spider-Man Far From Home is going to be another billion dollar film. Which, by the way, if you're keeping count, will make three billion dollar films in a row for for the, for the MCU. How's that? How do you like that? Um, but yeah, 15 years from now, as we're looking at the next 25 films, and the MCU is now at you know, 48, 50 movies, we're going to look back and Endgame is going to be just another MCU film. A big one, an important one, a significant one, but one nonetheless. And I think we're going to get a real sense of how the MCU moves forward now post Endgame when we see Far From Home. That'll give us that. All right, just a couple more here. Doshi writes, Tony thought Rocket was a -a Build-A-Bear. So funny. God, that was so great. And he goes, I'm not going to lie to you. Up until right now, I thought you were a -A Build-A-Bear. That was such a great line. It was such a great line, and especially in the moment, you know, Marvel does this great thing of, in the moments of really emotionally charged moments, they'll throw in a little bit of humor to break that tension, you know, and I, they just know when to do it, and that moment was great. I, I thought that was fantastic. Roni Shama writes, Soul Stone does what? Uh, Black Widow and Hawkeye movie, please. Peter age. Well, Peter is going to be the same age that he was when he dusted. So Peter is the age that he was in Infinity War. At least that's the assumption. He comes out as he was when he dusted. So I'm thinking that's it. I don't think we're going to see Hawkeye in a Black Widow movie. Because I think Black Widow... Remember, if I'm right, and I could totally be wrong. I I don't feel any conviction on this. But if I'm right, and the Black Widow movie takes place in the five years in between Infinity War and Endgame then remember, she hasn't seen Clint during that whole period. He's off doing his murder thing. He's off murdering people around the world. So I don't think we're going to see them together for a while. All right, Captain Mexico. Final question, guys, and then uh, we'll pick it up on the next video. Captain Mexico writes, how does Cap return the Soul Stones exactly how they were when he would have to recreate a cube, scepter, place Power Stone back, and return a Soul Stone? Oh, hi, Red Skull. Can I return this Soul Stone? I, I, I... Dude, I am completely in agreement with you. And why to get them do you have to create three separate teams with nine or ten team members to go out and get the Soul Stones? Ah, but it's not that important. The returning them isn't that important. Let's just send one guy. Let's send one guy with no backup. Just go. I'm sure it'll work out fine. That made no sense. It doesn't matter how much we adore the movie and how much fun we had with the movie and how orgasmic the final hour was and all that kind of stuff. That made no sense. But just like a lot of other things I talked about in this video, Captain Mexico, about how, you know, if the inconsistency gave us a big payoff, I'm fine with the inconsistency. That whole thing made no sense. But the payoff was getting to see Steve have his life with Peggy. That causes problems. It's inconsistent with how they got to it. It makes no sense that he went off on his own to return the stones. I get it. But if the payoff was worth it, and damn it, the payoff was worth it, then I'm okay with it. I mean, it doesn't mean we don't point it out. Of course we point out. Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem in the movie, but I'm fine with it because it was so great to see that scene, and we got that scene because they did that. And so with that... I'm kind of okay with it. All right, guys. (coughs) Pardon me. That will do it for this quick installment of our Avengers Endgame open spoiler discussion supplemental video 
Number one, Robert and I are both going to be doing these things. There's probably going to be five, six, seven, eight, nine of these things when it's all said and done. I'm not sure how many we have, but we're going to do them until we get through all of those questions you guys sent in during that five hour Avengers Endgame spoiler discussion. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Don't forget, check out the John Campy Show every day, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We'll be back on the air again tomorrow. Thanks again for being here. My name's John Campia, and until the next one, I love you 3,000.